Jim, thank you so much for joining us on This is Purdue. Oh, thank you. It's so good to be back. Good. Well, you're back in West Lafayette. How, how do you feel? Is there some nostalgia coming back? Oh, I love it. This is, you know, when when I think of West Lafayette, I, you know, I think of family. I think of uh, uh, all the good times we've had. Some of the memories we've made, you know, around here on and off the field are just um, remarkable. So, yeah, every time I come back, it's it's like coming home. And you're here because you're being inducted into the Indiana Football Hall of Fame. Congrats. Thank you very much. Um, how does that make you feel? Are you just overwhelmed or were you surprised? Well, you know, I always looked at football as a team sport. And I, I know there's individual honors. and I've been on the end of, of some fine honors. And this is absolutely one of the best. So um, anyone I'm honored. Um, but I also have a lot of thanks. Thanks for my teammates, my coaches. Um, Leon Burtnett, who passed away. I mean, all these all these people in my life who, who touched me. And so it kind of motivates me to try to pay it forward and yeah, think about, OK, we've got this. We're doing these things. But I couldn't have gone up there without my parents, my teammates, uh, Purdue, the whole the whole deal. So I'm appreciative um, of not only the award, but of, of the family, I guess I don't want to call it that it was all part of it with me. And, and that to me is super rewarding. And let's go back to your time at Purdue. So you went to high school in New Mexico. Oh, yeah. What brought you to Purdue in the first place? Well, I was being recruited nationally. Um, we had a really good team. We were uh, undefeated. We had six guys go division one for a New Mexico team. So that was, wow. we were, yeah, we were, we were pretty. And so it finally came down to, between Stanford and Purdue. And both of them are great quarterback schools. And I, I just don't think I was ready for California just yet. <laughs> As but, you are there now. Okay. And, well, I kinda, I'm a late bloomer. <laughs> and it's pretty nice out there. Uh, you know, there's there's the good and bad in every place that you live in. And, uh, you know, I just I just found that that was a, a nice place. The weather's good, the whole thing. But going back on how I got here, there was a lady named Wona Deverman, who was an English teacher at El Dorado High School. And she was a Purdue alumni. And she ended up getting on the phone with Jim Young. She was instrumental on making sure Jim came out and had a personal visit. And I was just, you know, at the time, Mark Herman, all the success they were having at Purdue and Cradle of the Quarterbacks was all, I'm like, yeah, I want to be part of that. You know, I don't want to be an astronaut yet, but I don't want to be one of those quarterbacks. <laughs> so, uh, and it, it wasn't easy either because, you know, there was, there was the journey along the way. They had Scott Campbell. They had, I was a backup. I was, you know, fourth string. So it wasn't like, hey, Jim, here's, you know, just come and, and, you know, nowadays it's like guys jumping in and out of the portal. They change stuff. You know, we, we didn't have it that easy back then. So there was a lot of uh, endurance, patience, uh, and a lot of hard work that went into it. And a lot of um, stuff that each one of my teammates had to push each other um, for us to, you know, be at a time that we could have a season where we beat a Michigan, Notre Dame, Ohio State. And uh, to me, that's, that's that was really cool. Yeah, like how did that teach you, you know, overall in life, a lot of guys nowadays would leave if they had to wait to play quarterback for three years like you did. How did that teach you like persistence and, and overall life lessons when you think back on that? Well, it was a different mindset. You know, we didn't have phones in our pockets. We didn't <laughs> we didn't have instant media. We didn't have all these <laughs> different, you know, we kind of had to figure, I mean, if you had a question, you have to actually look at an encyclopedia to find an answer. But now it's just instantaneous. So um, life was different. Um, it was a different pace uh, and it was like if you were going to do something, you kind of had to create it. Um, you had to work really hard for it. And I'm not saying that that still not applies today because it does. It's just that um, we had a coaching change from Jim, Jim Young to Leon Burtonette. And nowadays, I think a lot of guys could move with your coaches or, you know, move instantaneously. We we had it still had the year penalty at our time. So ah. it was one of those things that you just don't do off the cuff and just say, hey, I'm out of here. Um, so you work through it. And plus Leon kept the staff with Bob Spoo and Jim Coletto and all those guys. So I was very familiar with that. I just had to learn their, earn their trust to be their quarterback, which man, it was a, it was a tough road and uh, but very rewarding. Do you think your teammates helped you within that too? And kind of that team like spirit and Boilermaker spirit? It did. I mean, I like my roommate who Jack Berry is the godparents of my kids and still influential in my life. Um, so 
yeah, I mean, we had discussions and, you know, I didn't want to leave my family to go do something else. Um, I had thought about one time going to San Diego State and the staff wanted me there and as much as we could, you know, talk during those times. Um, but I really wanted to be a Purdue quarterback and maybe it's because um, sometimes when you have a hard head, it pays off and sometimes it doesn't. But this one, it did. <laughs> For you, it paid off. <laughs> yeah. So we talk about, you know, that that trifecta, Notre Dame, Ohio State and Michigan, that you led the team to those three victories and it hasn't happened since. Were people doubting the Purdue team back then? Like, were people surprised that you and the team were able to pull that off? You know, it's it's the tradition people are going to doubt. It's the mindset of the team. That makes the difference. So. You know, when you're talking about five star recruiting athletes, you know, you're competing with the Alabamas, you got Ohio State, you got. And so we had to figure out some other different ways that we were going to find victories. And that had to do with, you know, our mentality, um, maybe not believing the box mm -hmm. that people want to put us in. Tell us about a fun favorite memory that you had playing at Purdue. Fun playing memory. All right. I would say one of my first starts my junior year, and we were playing Notre Dame at this old the, the the first game ever in Indianapolis in the Hoosier Dome, which now has already changed yeah. out. But that's the NFL. That's a whole nother, <laughs> other story. But uh, so Notre Dame agrees to have their home game moved down to Indianapolis. It's a start that, you know, I've got two blue chip all americans doug downing jeff huber behind me and leon says you know if you're not heads and shoulders above these freshmen i'm gonna start a freshman i'm like all right so i, I better play good <laughs> so, no pressure. Pressure, no pressure. <laughs> so we're playing them I mean, it's so funny because a good friend of mine in california steve berline who anyway, i talk to all the time was the quarterback it was a freshman quarterback for notre dame oh. and so um they were ranked i believe number two in the country or number two or eight, one of those. Uh, uh, and so, you know, again, the, the box they put us in is we didn't have a chance. Um, we ended up going down to that stadium. It wasn't, it wasn't as like going into Notre Dame. Them moving a home game to a neutral mm -hmm. site was very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, and, our, and our fans showed up and that's what Purdue does. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we gave them a few things to scream about. <laughs> so, after that game, uh, I, job security wasn't uh, as much of an issue <laughs> as it was <laughs> before. Your worth. And so I could kind of relax and kind of get in my groove and it, it built confidence. And I think, you know, you're looking at 20 year old guys. And if you can build confidence in young people, big things happen. Yeah. I, I just had the pleasure of talking to Coach Brom and he almost had those exact same words and just building up these young men into people that are good on and off the field. Right. Right. And I think in today's age, it's easy to criticize our leaders, easy to criticize mistakes, easy to do other stuff. But uh, when you're in a position where you can build somebody mm -hmm. and they're, and they're young people believing in themselves, very powerful. Yeah. So you won the big 10 medal of honor. It's a huge, huge achievement. Yeah. Um, how did you feel at the time when you, when you won that? At the time, to be honest, I, I you know, I, was, I don't know if I really understood mm -hmm. all the, all the stuff. I look back on it now. I look back at, you know, being two time Purdue athlete of the year. I, I mean, I didn't really, you know, when you're involved in something and you're so engrossed in what you're doing and focus and pro football was and trying to try, I, I don't think that stuff didn't really hit me until later, a little bit later in life and going, Oh, wow. That was, that was pretty special. Oh, wow. That, you know, um, even Sigma Chi being a significant SIG hit me a little bit later. It's like, and maybe because this is the first year I'm a grandpa, maybe I'm reflecting a little bit more, but I'm, I'm looking at it, uh, um, looking at things a little different and uh, way more appreciative of understanding what all that is and what those, what those awards mean. So it took, I'm going to be honest. It took me some time to really put that in perspective about, where they were because I felt like I was still in the moment, still making advancements in other, trying to be an all pro, trying to be the best I could. Um, 
And then watching guys like Drew Brees do it for 20 years. I mean, we had different rules back then. They actually used to hit us. <laughs> I could imagine playing that game to age 40, but now they're doing it. I mean, Tom Brady, <laughs> good luck, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is different. Um, so part of the Big Ten Medal of Honor is academics. Tell us about your academic life at Purdue and what you majored in. Well, that was one of the main reasons why I came to Purdue. I mean, it was a industrial management degree um, from the business school at Craner. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the other schools, I didn't feel... All right, let me fill this in backstory. My parents, my dad was a professor, my mom was a teacher. So academics was always kind of like, you know, bring home the A was automatic. That yeah. was what we did. So our expectations were up here. And so when I was looking at my school choices between a school like Stanford and Purdue, to me, they were on par about what they want to do. Uh, Stanford was more economics. Purdue was a little bit more uh, business and I wanted computers. Even though we were doing the computers back in the day when we put the cards in and all that <laughs> stuff. And not like today, what we have in our pocket was way, way more stronger than what we could buy. But I always kind of liked the tech stuff. I still do. Um, and it was a way for me to kind of hit my other love as far as being able to be involved in business. Um, which I ran an asset management company for almost 15 years. And so I got to apply that. And of course, we were one of the first in the technology in, to go all digital. And I think we're still moving all digital mm -hmm. to today. And it's it's a transition that I've got to see during my lifetime from, um, you know, the first Mac computers to uh, phones in your pocket to, you know, possibly money being digital. Right. So when you look back at the draft, you know, like you're saying, there wasn't social media, there wasn't all of this almost, I mean, there was hype around it, right? But it's a different type of hype. What were you feeling like as a very young man, as a first round draft pick? Well, for, first of all, I didn't know where I was going to go. Okay. Okay. So the draft is a, is a you know, as everybody knows, you, you don't know if you're going to be playing in a cold weather place or, um, so as our draft went down, um, Bo Jackson goes one and we all, everyone on the planet knew Bo Jackson was going one. Atlanta has the next pick. They don't have a quarterback, but they decided to go to, and I met with Dan Henning on our way going down to uh, spring break. They picked Tony Casillas. And I'll hold that back because we played Atlanta every year, and I had that in the back of my head the whole time. Like, Atlanta didn't pick me. So when you see these guys get drafted in the, like Dak Prescott, you know, teams passed on him three times. He didn't get drafted in the fourth round in, 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 by Dallas. So he's looking at every team going, I want them. I want them. They make it personal and don't think they don't. <laughs> well, Houston has the third pick. They got Warren Moon and Indianapolis has the fourth. Well, Indianapolis needs a quarterback. My agent's working with Indianapolis, which was maybe not as legal at the time, but we pretty much had a contract. So I kind of knew where I was going to be. I thought I was going to be a fourth pick. Well, Houston ends up picking me and you know, make a long story short, they ended up picking me to trade me. And uh, while I thought I was preparing to go 60 miles down the road and play for the Colts because they needed the quarterback, um, my path went differently. Got drafted by Houston, ended up with trade bait. And it was kind of a, I felt like a piece of meat. And, you know, I ended up moving out to, uh, and there's stories within that. I almost went to Green Bay, I almost went to San Francisco, ended up with the Rams. And uh, it worked out from there. But it was kind of nice being able to go be a high draft pick and go to a team that was established. So sure. it was a little easier. Some of these guys coming out, um, Joe Burrow over in Cincinnati, first pick, goes to a bad team. So, Troy Aikman, uh, first pick, goes to Dallas, goes 1-15 the first year. Um, there's a lot of things that people could say, oh, you know, Troy was a bust because of that first year. A lot of things that would happen today or they try to, you know, put you in that box. I'm talking about it, but this is, this is, let's label him as a bust or this or that. Well, he might be playing for a bad team and usually the number one pick guys are. So I, I'm slow to judge on, on quarterbacks. Um, I think it takes a while to develop. I think uh, we're going to see, you know, probably uh, I think Jack's first start, a uh, plumber's first start, or, you know, for, and I'm going to judge him on one game. But he needs to develop, and if he is the ticket, then, you know, Purdue has a lot better chance. So were you bummed about not 
playing for the Colts? Were you, was your heart set on that? Well, I, well, I, would, I really, you know, because we had a draft party in the morning and we all knew it's going to be Indianapolis. It's good. And then when Houston calls me on the phone, I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, okay, I got to fly down to Houston and do all these interviews. And I'm not, I would just felt like I was just out of sorts. It was, I was, yeah, I was prepared to play for the Colts. I was looking for it. They needed a quarterback. They needed someone to, we led the offense. Uh, the nation on offense the last two years in the in college of course i think i could have done great things for the colts it would have been you know an easy transition mm -hmm. it just didn't work out that way yeah like were you shell-shocked going from west lafayette indiana to eventually los angeles well it was not that quick because i actually had to hold out okay. so and then i had to really threaten to sit out for the next draft and it was three days before the deadline i didn't get traded so yeah, there was a lot of drama between <laughs> just just going from West Lafayette there. I actually, uh, at the time, uh, invited Chuck Long, who was actually holding out from Detroit, invited him to go to Hawaii with me so we both would uh, maybe hold up our contract values. But he caved and went went to Detroit. <laughs> and uh, But, um, yeah, it took a while. As a matter of fact, the first year I was in a hotel the whole year just trying to learn an offense and end up starting at the end of the year. So, I mean, I didn't have... I didn't have any time to really enjoy the California life. It wasn't until that next year I started, you know, find a place to live, try to get settled. Really, we brought in a new offense. Um, but there's a lot of work. And that's when I when I look at the, the pro football and you see the games on Sundays, there's a heck of a lot of work that goes into it. Even with college levels, all the, the stuff you see on Saturday, the preparation that they do and the limitations now that you can have with the athletes. Um, very really difficult. Your system has to be clean, has to be easy, has to be, and then the guys have to really want to self do it. Self, and if you've got a team that can motivate themselves to try to get that extra practice reps in because of the, the rules they have now, um, and even with the pros, I mean, I go to the camps, they don't have two days anymore, they have one, but it's a lot of mental reps and you have to have guys that are disciplined. And do you think when we talk about social media and how that's exploded, like, would you have been able to play now with all of these people, with all this hate that they, what is it called? The Monday? Twitter? Oh, I would love social media. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I would have loved it. I would, I would. Would you right. have clapped no, back? We, no, well, this is the deal. Back in our time, if you, if you had someone wrote a story, you can't respond. <laughs> And so it would behoove you to be friends with these guys so you could, and, and, they, and we had, we, we would go out and have beers with, uh, with Jeff and, and the stories that you would tell me, like, Hey, don't, don't tell them I'm saying this, but this is what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. We, you know, you'd kind of give them a little, uh, well, in the nineties when the whole media bomb changed and we had sports illustrated and, and, and all these new sporting news and all that, mm -hmm. and well, that became competition and then it became all these different stories. And it wasn't always someone writing something friendly about you. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, uh, I remember there was a, a reporter in, in general, he had his own agenda, trying to either run out of coach, one time running me out. And so then you didn't have a way to respond. It's unless you had another friend in the media. Now, you can just call it out. Right. You can go right to the public. You can say, hey, no, this isn't how it is. Now, on the flip side, yeah, you can say something really stupid right. really quick. Right. Um, so, yeah, but if you're going to ask me, would Jim, would you rather have a voice or not have a voice? I'll take the voice. Now, is there mistakes possible that young men can make? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I give them a hall pass too, because we're all human. Right. So Nobody's I think there's, perfect. there's some goods and bads, but I think there it's, it's very, very cool. That's, that's an interesting take. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> like I said, you came from West Lafayette, you know, you lived here. And then you moved to LA and I know it took some time to adjust, but what about like, how was it different for you to immerse yourself on the West coast, you know, versus well, the East coast? Well, first, first of all, I was, I came from Kansas, went, grew up in New Mexico. Coming to West Lafayette was a, was a, was an adjustment for me. Going back out to California wasn't as much as mm. an adjustment for me. I mean, I was used to the mountains, the desert being from New Mexico. Um, the sky being, um, you know, a little bit more clear. So, I mean, I, the traffic, mm, all the, all the other, you know, busy stuff, the, the competition with the Lakers and the Dodgers. I mean, it's, it's, 
there's a lot of stuff to do out there and a lot of competition. I didn't realize that. I mean, when you're in West Lafayette, when you're the, the show on Saturday, you're the show. Mm -hmm. When you're in California, you got a show on Saturday. Well, you might, you know, you, you've got a bunch of shows going on, <laughs> not even maybe entertainment or uh, so you're just kind of a kind of there's a bigger pond out there. Uh -huh. So it was that was an interesting part, but uh, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoy the weather enjoy the um i enjoy the fan base um it's a little bit more of a melting pot you have a lot more diversity in all different facets of life um so yeah i fit in fine with that and it works out well but it was a it wasn't as much of a transition i thought it was a hard transition coming from new mexico to here and experiencing the like third coldest day in Purdue's history at one point in time. Oh. <laughs> After 20 inches of snow, oh. I'm like, what did I just get myself into? Yeah. <laughs> Those are not fun days at Purdue. <laughs> they, they happen every once in a while. Not not uh, not often, but they used to have this machine that would that would spin and knock all the snow off. Well, sometimes that machine would go down and all it would do is be like a Zamboni for the sidewalks. <laughs> <laughs> You'd see people just wiping out. And I was like, oh, this is this is good. <laughs> We gotta set up a camera out here. Um, so tell us about a favorite experience or story with the Rams. A favorite experience with the Rams. I, I've i got a ton of those. I mean, we spent 12 years and the seasons were, I probably probably have to talk about playing New York, okay. the Giants. And I don't care which game you wanna pick. I just love playing the Giants. <laughs> you know, the Giants are the type of team that they, their fans know more about your mom than you know. And so when you play them, you, you really want to, you know, just, just get after them because when, when they're quiet, when there was fan, it's the best. So I would have to say there was a championship game we were playing and we were uh, going into overtime and, and hip flipper for a touchdown and he keeps running through the end zone. And man, when, when that stadium was quiet, it was, it was like the best. <laughs> And there's always this New York, LA, you oh, yeah. know, big city thing. But that was just, I mean, we always like playing Dallas too. Man, I, you always had the extra gear to play Dallas just because, just, just because San Francisco, same thing. So, um, I, but I'd have to say one of my favorite moments would have to be against the Giants. Picking the, there was one time we threw five touchdowns against them, and Belichick was the defensive coordinator, and oh. so that was that was kind of cool. They kept trying to play this cover two, and we we kept hitting the turkey hole on them, and, it, and he just couldn't stop it. <laughs> and no, well, it was there was there's many many other ones. I had such a good relationship with Ernie Zampezi, our offensive coordinator, and Norv Turner, and all the guys there, and John Robinson. I thought was treated everyone like men um and that's a coaching style that i like i mean it where you, it's respectful um you get the most out of your guys and you treat them like men did you speaking of men i mean did you feel like you had to grow up fast being in the nfl at that young of an age so honestly when i first got to the nfl i thought purdue prepared me very very well it really did i mean i thought our offense at purdue Initially, when I first came and played with Eric Dickerson, it was it was kind of Mickey Mouse passing game. I mean, it was they, they that. I mean, you got a running back ran for two thousand yards on the ground. You don't really have to develop much else, right? <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure Tennessee does that with uh, Derrick Henry. You know, it's it's a lot less pressure. But we got into the point where we needed to step our passing game, and that's when I think that our offense started started taking off is when we started getting more complex so um, some of the some of the stuff coach brahm is is using some of the west coast offense some of the different uh, uh things and that's where our development i think from probably two to five years in the league really really took off because we were doing a lot more complex things and that was that was that was a fun part of this league when you're doing things and the, and the defense can't figure it out um they eventually all do. And then they move to a different system or then they have mobile quarterbacks or then they have, you know, wildcat offense. There's always something new, but it's, if you look through the history of sports, you usually pick and choose different eras and you can bring something back and coaches haven't seen it, you know, and 
call, uh, high school, they were doing all the pistol offense. That was new. Well, that's old. That's uh, the wishbone will probably come back. So when you think about, um, so now you're in Southern California. Mm -hmm. The Rams left. They came back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you involved with them now because they're back? Well, uh, that was an interesting time. Um, the Rams, I left a year, I went for, to New Orleans the year before they left. So we had a chance to come back and play them. And they were a bad team. <laughs> I was on a bad team. It was, it was we, were playing, we just, we killed them. They didn't have a chance. And uh, we talk about that off. So then they moved to St. Louis. And if, if people know the economics of the NFL, it all makes sense. Mm. It wasn't about the fans. It wasn't about the city. It was all about the money and stadiums. So if you have a stadium, you get revenue share, 60-40, but everything behind the glass goes to the home team. So that's why you see all these stadiums with big glass, all boxes, that the home team gets to keep that money. So if you're playing in like the Coliseum, there's no glass, you're sharing all the revenue with your opponent. Jerry Jones makes all the money at his place and then he makes a lot more money at your place. So it doesn't make economic sense unless you have a great stadium. St. Louis had a great stadium. Georgia could make a lot more money. And I don't know anybody that works that wants to work for less. If there's an opportunity to make more money, like anybody else, a plumber, electrician, uh, anybody that's working, it made perfect sense for her to go. It didn't have anything to do with that. Um, as far as the California fan base or this or that. Now, California doesn't like losers. And so she was losing it on that part because they just didn't have a good team. And I was part of a team that wasn't good at, at the end. Um, so I went to New Orleans. It was, you know, we ended up having a top ranked offense again for the next you know, two or three years. And that was, that was fun. And then, uh, um, so then I stayed in LA. We were without a team for 21 years. Um, I always thought it would be a new franchise that came back or a, you know, whatever, what would they call them? What would it be? And then Jacksonville, there was rumors, Jackson. I mean, every time a team needed a new stadium mm -hmm. at their home place, they would say, we're going to LA. <laughs> <laughs> There's no stadium in LA. That was, they were just using it for leverage. And that's what the NFL likes to do. It wasn't until Kroenke came in, Stan Kroenke, and then he developed, he, he committed $5 billion to build the stadium. I mean, let that sink in. Who runs around and has five billion dollars just for you know a house i mean that's that's pretty impressive and if it wasn't someone like mr Cronky, it wasn't going to happen so by him taking out um, the race park putting in this development his stadium um his personal commitment which was huge that whole sofi stadium wouldn't happen rams wouldn't be back the chargers wouldn't be there the um so that was a huge commitment and jerry jones knew that and that's why he brought Mr. Cronky in. And so that's very progressive. Um, a lot of stuff that went down. It was very interesting. And yeah, I, I do. When they came back, they would call us Sam. I, I, oh, totally. I mean, they're bringing the horns back. I, I mean, I'm the all time leading passer for the last, for the Los Angeles Rams, but all my records are in St. Louis. It was, I'd show up to St. Louis and be like, who's, who's this guy? Oh. <laughs> what is it? So I just felt like, uh, I mean, I was talking to Jack Youngblood about that the other day. He's like, we were kind of felt like outcasts. Just like, a, we were like, oh, we had our, we had our time here. Yeah, but all our records are some, some other city, <laughs> you know, like Warren Moon. He had all his records in Houston, but now they're all in Tennessee. It's just kind of, it's kind of weird. Right. Um, but, but having the home team come back, uh, different management, um, different mindset. Coach McVay is doing great things. Um, Aaron Donald is absolute beast. Um, I, they, he was holding out in camps all these years for contracts. They were glad, or at least the offensive side, because he just blows up practice. I mean, you can't block him. So they were they were happy, like, yeah, Aaron, keep holding out for more money because we don't want to we don't want to block you during practice. <laughs> <laughs> and they can't block him during games either. He's so legit. So are you helping behind the scenes there, or just kind of you like to go back for fun and? Hang out? Well, I, my role is uh, somewhat of an ambassador. Okay. Um, they have a legends program. I'm trying to uh, push them on to uh, develop some of the rambassador issues going <laughs> further, but I haven't had much success yet, and I can <laughs> leave it at that. But we're, there's things going back and forth. And, you know, when a team just comes back, there's, there's things that they have to develop in the community. Um, I think their focus has been so much on stadium on developing the product on the field 
I think some of the other issues um, probably aren't on the hierarchy of where they're at and, and need be. I mean, Super Bowl is site one, and I think that's the goal of all 32 teams. And, you know, if, uh, you know, I do, I still follow the Colts. I still follow the Saints, I, um, uh, New England, their success. I, I kind of root for offenses when I see games. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I know I know the defensive coordinators, or I need, at least I know where they've come from. So I know a little bit of it. So yeah, I stay close to the game as far as that goes. Um, but yeah, there's going to be some involvement with the Rams at some point. Uh, with just what the official capacity is. We, we haven't determined yet. Okay. <laughs> so after you retired, you kind of took a route that a lot of NFL players don't. You went back to school and got your master's. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that experience and, and why you decided to do that. The education was always a big thing that we talked about earlier um, in our life. I was the least educated in my family, having my, being a bachelor's degree. And so I had somewhat of family peer pressure to get my master's. <laughs> also, I needed a transition from coming out from the NFL. And I think it's very difficult for some guys, it was for me, to transition from Hey, this is what I want to do with my whole life. Mm -hmm. And now I got to do that. And then they, and no, I don't, people say, I want to retire on my own terms. Well, no one ever really does that. It's just, you can say that with some sort of pride to right. protect your pride, but you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's just be real. And so, you know, you're coming through this point where the thing you've done your whole life. And so then you transition to saying, you know, I need to reset. And I need a hard reset right now because I, as I don't want to cling on to this or I could have gone into coaching. I could have gone into announcing. There were some other issues. We, I had some family stuff I wanted to resolve. The best thing was for me to be around and to extend my education. And I went to Pepperdine, which is a fabulous school. Um, it's a, it was a program, their business program where it was, Pepperdine's in Malibu, but I was in the Orange County campus. So I got to network with people in the Orange County area where I was living. Um, I met some lifelong friends, professors, and still to this day, um, in contact. So it, it was, it was a good, it was a good transition. And then I started my asset management business. Um, and it was a boutique firm. It was, I could manage my time and, and, and manage our, our, our money and, do the things that I love to do. Uh -huh. um, and like I said, with technology, we were on the edge. And so it, it was challenging on a, a, a different fronts. It was time consuming more so probably than all the football stuff, maybe not physically, but the mental part. And it was, uh, it was good. I, it was, I ended up after 15 years of getting out of it, I had some, you know, health issues that we had to ha resolve, which we have uh, with, with modern science. <laughs> Because you don't go through 12 years of the NFL scot-free. For sure. <laughs> I mean, replacement parts. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what appeals to you about assets management? I always liked it. I always di uh, dibble dabble in finance. Um, I think when I hired, matter of fact, if my, my asset manager at the time was from Stanford hmm. and Chuck was uh, uh, my mentor, really. And I was actually going to go in business with their firm until he suddenly passed and, and we talked about it. And so rather than joining a firm without my mentor, it was easier for me to start my own. And some of his clients came with me. And so it was, it was an easy transition, but it was, it was tough because I lost my guy. Um, but it was good because it forced me to get out. And sometimes you have to get out of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. um, to really find out what things are all about. And, and I was there. Now, do you keep up with the Purdue program today? Do you have any, um, anything that you think would be a good tip for the team? <laughs> well, I do follow. I don't follow as intently as, as maybe I see some of the Ram things. Um, and that's just a proximity thing. Mm -hmm. If I was closer here, I absolutely would. Um, I totally believe in Jeff Brom. I think his program, I don't think he has the pieces to his puzzle. And I think that's been the issue. The COVID year, man, that was crazy. So, Recruiting, um, I think, you know, as far as, as, you know, 
Jeff needs to have his guys. I think it starts at quarterback. Rondell, uh, um, Rondell, I love watching. I just didn't think that he had the pieces around him to complement. What he's going to do in Arizona is going to be phenomenal. King, uh, Kingsbury is going to take him and roll, um, and he'll be a featured part. It'll be like, he, but you know, he had these stats at Purdue, but he didn't have the same parts around him. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about an offense. Like I said, when I played for Purdue, we had six guys. Yeah, we had six guys drafted on our offense. And, you know, if it was just two guys drafted on offense, that's not enough. So you need to have pieces around you that complement you. The most, my most successful years in Los Angeles, we had pieces. Is when you start taking them out, you're not. And so I think that would be the thing that from a, from a 30,000 feet with, with, Coach Brahm is he's got to get the, his pieces in place. And I think that's, you know, the time is it's coming up to make sure. And, you know, a quarterback, that's that's a huge piece. And I think that's kind of been unsettled. What does the Purdue community mean to you after all these years? Oh man. Stability, um, reliability, um, faithful, family. Um, Everywhere I go, even when my daughter was riding horses, we had Purdue people in the horse industry. And uh, I mean, there's a contact that's that's or a, a base that's whatever walk of life you're in, you seem to run into Purdue people. And then there's a bond. And how to describe that to people that don't have a Purdue degree is 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 tough. But uh, the networking. It, and and, and, the, and the, usually the people that you meet that are boilermakers are somewhat reasonable. <laughs> Maybe like, you know, Jayhawks, <laughs> my fiance over there is a, <laughs> pretty good people. Those Jayhawks are pretty good people too. <laughs> we'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything else you want to tell our listeners? Some of them are... I'm sure faithful, loyal fans of yours from yeah. Purdue to the Rams to the Saints. Well, I think I'd like to, you know, tell everybody I appreciate your support and, and coming back for the Indiana State Football Hall of Fame is is beyond my wildest dreams. Um, I think that it's it's um, you know Purdue's a place where great things happen, and but we have patience and we're reasonable, but we also want and desire and crave, you know, good football. And, you know, I was fortunate to be part of some of those programs. I was on some programs earlier in my career that we, we weren't, um, but it takes a whole team effort and getting the right. And I think Bobinski's doing a, a good job trying to put the right pieces together because it goes all the way from the top, all the way down to the guys that walk on and you know, I think that you got to have some belief. And I think people at Purdue continue to have belief. And I love that.